Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about loops in switching converters and have a look at how these layout features impact EMC emissions. Now last time that I looked at this we saw how keeping loops small in general will help keep the converters emissions small. But that is not always a possibility because of the physical size of the components involved. So you will have to end up making some compromises somewhere. So what I want to look at today is which of the loops are more critical and why. What I'm talking about of course is the so-called hot loop. So if you're curious about what that is and how it can be identified then keep watching. So just as last time I will be focusing on magnetic field emissions. So let's start off by looking at the loops that the current takes when it travels through a converter. For the sake of simplicity, I will be analyzing a boost converter. But the same principles apply regardless of converter topology. So with this converter, we have two cycles, charging and discharging of the inductor. So in the first cycle, we get current from the input capacitor, charging the inductor, closing down through the switch and back through the ground. And in the second cycle, we get current from the input capacitor, through the inductor, through the second switch, which is usually a diode, and then closing through the output capacitor and back through ground. Now, the two loops will be creating noise because the current flow is non-DC. So we will get noise created by this loop of current and we will get noise created by the second loop of current. And because this physical area, so the one around the first loop, has current around it in both cycles, we would expect that the largest amount of noise will come from this physical area. So both loops will be generating noise in this particular part of the circuit. So let's check it out. Previously, I used a large area near field probe that was allowing me to pick up the noise from the entire circuit. But today I will be using this small near field probe that is built from a small ferrite rod and a few turns. This should help us pinpoint the noise source a bit more accurately. And for the first measurement, let's look at this board that has intentionally large loops on both sides. So to better observe the noise sources. So for this measurement, I set the spectrum analyzer to go from 1 MHz up to 400 MHz. So it's starting off just below the switching frequency of 1.2 MHz that the converter has. I have my near field probe connected directly to the spectrum analyzer and the board I'm supplying from a 5 volt supply and I connected the 50 milliamp load to it. So if we start to measure the noise, so if I come over the input loop, so the one formed between the inductor, the input capacitor and the switch, we can see that there is noise, there's quite a lot of noise. So let's just save this. So we see our switching frequency and the harmonics and they slowly die down. So as expected from switching converter. But now if we take a second trace and we go with our probe over the other loop, so the output loop, we see a slightly different story. So let's just freeze this for a moment. So we don't just see noise, we see more noise than we saw previously. So at our fundamental frequency and let's say the first couple peaks we see roughly similar values but as we move to higher frequencies we clearly see that the high frequency content is significantly larger with our probe on the output loop. So not really what we were expecting. So what's going on? Why is the output loop so noisy? Well it seems we found our hot loop. Now we can check out the currents that normally pass through a boost converter by using a circuit simulation. LT spice of course. So this will be far easier than to measure the circuit. So what I got here is a basic boost converter. So we got our input capacitor, the inductor, the switch, the diode, and then the output capacitor. So if we run the simulation and have a look at the currents running through the various components, and we zoom in a bit, we mainly see two kinds of waveforms. So on our input capacitor and inductor, we see a nice triangle shaped waveform. Whereas on the switch, diode and output capacitor, we see this trapezoid shape. So we can see the turn on, turn off phases in the switch, 
when the switch is on, current is passing through it. When the switch is off, there's no current passing through it. And we get these nice, sharp current transitions. Now, if we analyze the waveforms in a bit more detail by using an FFT analysis, so I'll just be looking at the current going through the switch and say current going through the inductor, because these are the two representative waveforms, so a triangle and a trapezoid, we see two distinctively different type of spectrum. So the fundamental is the same with roughly the same amplitude in both cases, but the upper frequency harmonics look completely different. So with the inductor current, the triangle shape, the harmonics quickly die down, whereas with the switch current, so the trapezoid, we get a lot of harmonics going up into the high frequency region. So this is far more obvious when the two spectrum are overlapping. So here in the high frequency range, we get a far bigger difference in between the two spectrons than at low frequencies. Now in real life, other than this base current waveform, we also get ringing caused by the various parasitics present in the circuit. And again, these parasitics will be excited by the high frequency content waveforms on the output side of the converter. And that's where even more high frequency noise will be visible. And all of this is coming from the sharp current transitions. So the hot loop can be defined as the loop around which all of the components have discontinuous current. So in the case of the boost converter, these components are the diode, the switch, and the output capacitor, since all three of these components have discontinuous current variation. Now we can identify this sort of loop in any converter topology, and the components around this loop should be the ones that are responsible for creating the most amount of high frequency magnetic noise. Now, the hot loop will always contain the switches in the converter. So for example, in the case of the buck, we have the hot loop around the input capacitor and switches, whereas in the boost converter, we have it around the switches and the output capacitor. But depending on the converter, you can have more than one hot loop. So for example, in the four switch buck boost, we have two hot loops, one on the input and one on the output. And regardless of how many loops the converter has, the hot loops need to be kept as small as possible to get the most benefit in reducing magnetic field noise emissions. So now let's verify this claim. So to test this out, I prepared two new boards starting from the original design and schematic. So I'll be using the exact same schematic built around the integrated AP3012 boost converter. I got my 10 microhenry inductor, input and output capacitors, a diode and the feedback network, so this is the original design that had all of the loops large, and I prepared two new designs, one in which the input loop is small and one in which the output loop is small. So in this design, the IC is in the exact same position, the output loop is exactly the same, but the input loop was made much smaller. The inductor is brought much closer to the IC, so is the input capacitor. So in this design, the input loop is small. And the second design that I prepared has the output loop small. So here the input loop was left as it was with the original design with large loops, but the diode was brought much closer and so was the output capacitor. So this output loop is kept to its minimal size possible. So now let's see what sort of performance these two boards have. So this way, using the large field probe, we should be able to see which loop reduction brings the most amount of overall noise reduction. So which loop you should be focusing on to get the most benefit. So let's begin. So for this, I already prepared the two initial measurements. So we can see in yellow the emissions coming from the board that has all of the loops large. And we see in pink the noise coming from the board that has all of the loops small. So these are our two extremes. And we want to see which of our loops gets us closer to which of these initial noise measurements. So you can clearly see that the yellow trace has far more noise. So the large loops clearly are making far more noise than keeping all of the loops small. But now let's see which of the boards that we prepared today is closer to the all small loops. So first of all, I prepared the board in which the input loop is small and the output loop is large. So let's just close the shielding box. And if we run the measurement, well, it looks a bit messy, but let's just freeze it. So it might not be very clear at the moment, but if we remove some of the traces, so for example, I removed 
the one in which we had all of the loops large, we can clearly see that our third trace, so the one in turquoise, clearly has far more noise than the pink trace where we had all of the loops small. Now, on the other hand, if we compare our trace to the measurement in which we had all of the loops large, we basically see the same thing. So we can see all around quite large amount of emissions all throughout the spectrum and our new measurement, so with the input loop kept small, is almost the same as if we would have left all of the loops large. So now let's test out the board in which the output loop is small and the input loop is large. So again, let's close the shielding box and rerun the third trace. We're getting a completely different story. So let's just freeze this for a moment. So if we are now comparing it to our first trace, so the one with all of the loops large, again we can see that our noise has gone down significantly. And if we compare it to the trace in which we had all of the loops small, we see very similar results. So by keeping just the output loop small, we're getting almost exactly the same thing as we did with keeping all of the loops small. So the output loop, so the hot loop in the case of the boost converter, is the most critical and keeping this one small will bring the most amount of benefit. Now if we take a closer look at our last measurement, we might notice something a bit strange. So here in pink we have our previous board with all the loops small and in turquoise we have the current board with the small hot loop. And the new board, even though it has the input loop all large, it seems to be working much better, at least in certain places, than the previous board with all of the loops small. So how could that happen? Well, there's two things to consider here. First of all, the actual components that were used all have tolerances. So starting with the boost converter, we can see the frequency is slightly different, so that has some tolerance than the other components like the inductor, diode and so on. All of these have a certain amount of parameter variation, so that's perfectly normal. Secondly, the probe that I used and the setup in which it's sitting isn't always perfectly in exactly the same place. But other than these elements, there's one more thing to consider which is slightly more important than the other ones, and that is the actual board layout. So in the previous board, with all of the loops small, the hot loop, so formed between the diode switch inside of the converter and the output capacitor, has this small area in between it. So it's a small area, but it's not a neglectable area. On the other hand, the board that has only the hot loop small is slightly different. So the diode and the capacitor's position are slightly different, leading to a slightly smaller area enclosed by this hot loop. So even though the hot loop is small in both cases, in one case it's slightly smaller than in the other. And this of course has an effect on the measurement result. So a large hot loop is bad, small hot loop is good, and a tiny hot loop is even better. In the end, when designing your circuit, one of the fundamental principles that you need to apply to reduce noise is to keep your noisy areas small. In the case of switching converters, the part that generates the highest amount of magnetic field noise comes from the traces that carry currents that switch. So this continuous current variation will create a lot more magnetic field noise, especially in the high frequency range. So with any converter, it's a good idea to first identify the hot loop and then make sure that you keep it small. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos and see you next time. Bye bye.